from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got a story about a boy and a dragon, an inspiring read aloud, and a colorful science lesson. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanese, and I wonder if you have any pets at your house. Maybe you have a dog or a cat, but the boy in our next story wants a pet dragon. So to get this story started, let's go visit Mrs. Milanese. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Milanese. And today I'm going to be reading you a story. I found this story on an app called Epic. Epic is a free app that you can download onto a phone, tablet, or iPad, and there are tons of stories to choose from. I chose a really cool one for us today, so let's check it out. This book is called Me and My Dragon. Some kids want a dog. Others would like a cat. I want a dragon. But not a big dragon. A big dragon wouldn't fit in my house. I wouldn't want a three-headed dragon either. It might not get along with itself. I'd choose a fire-breathing dragon. Before I brought him home, I'd take him for a checkup. I'd hold his hand and tell him he was a brave little dragon. I'd make sure the doctor gave him a couple of lollipops. On the way home, he could sit with me, if Mom and Dad didn't mind. I'd give him a name, a place to stay, and some toys to play with. See, you named him Sparky. When I thought he was ready, I would teach him to fly. Uh Uh-oh. Phew. Whoa. I'd get him a collar and a leash, and I'd take him for a walk every day. If he was a naughty dragon, I might have to send him to school. After he learned to behave, I could take him camping in the summer and trick-or-treating in the fall. He could clear the neighbors' driveway in the winter. But I might not take him kite flying in the spring. If I missed the bus, he would help me get to school just in time for show and tell. Bullies? If you have a dragon, you don't need to worry about a bully. You don't need to worry about Brussels sprouts either. Dragons love them. But don't give them broccoli. It gives them gas. And you don't want a fire-breathing dragon with gas. Every night I'd give my dragon a bath. Bath time would be fun. Sometimes. I would pick out books that wouldn't give him nightmares and read to him until he got sleepy. I'd tuck him in and say good night. Then we'd fall asleep, just me and my dragon. Thanks, Mrs. Milanese. All right, next up, Miss McNeil is going to read us a story called The Rough Face Girl. Let's check it out. Hello, my name is Kimberly McNeil, and I was a 4 H agent here in Nicholas County for a number of years. And my real passion for the last several years has been literacy development. So I was really pleased when they asked me to come and be a part of Read Aloud. 
As I've gone through all the books that I have accumulated over the years, I came upon this one that's called The Rough Face Girl. The author is Rafe Martin and the illustrator is David Shannon. As I said before, we're going to be reading the story called The Rough-Faced Girl. And to see good rewarded and evil punished or justice is rare. Stories, however, pass on the realities of not everyday world, but of the human heart. One way in which the universal yearning for justice has been kept alive by its many tales of Cinderella. Indeed, some 1,500 or so versions of the basic Cinderella story type have been recorded so far, and each the cruel and thoughtless at last get their just reward, as do those who are kind and good. So, once long ago there was a village by the shores of Lake Ontario. All from the other wigwams of this village stood one great, huge wigwam. Painted on its sides were pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. And inside this wigwam, there was said to live a very great, rich, powerful, and supposedly handsome, invisible being. However, no one could see him except his sister, who lived there too. Many women wanted to marry this invisible being, but his sister said, only the one who can see him can marry him. Now in this village there lived a poor man who had three daughters. Sound familiar? The two older daughters were cruel and hard-hearted, and they made their youngest sister sit by the fire and feed the flames. When the burning branches popped, the sparks fell on her. In time, her hands became burnt and scarred, her arms too rough and scarred, oh, excuse me, her arms too became rough and scarred. Even her face was marked by the fire and her beautiful long black hair hung ragged and charred. And those two older sisters laughed at her saying, ha, huh, you're ugly, you rough faced girl. And they made her life very lonely and miserable indeed. Does that sound like Cinderella's story? One day these two older sisters went to their father and said, father, Give us some necklaces. Give us some new buckskin dresses. Give us some pretty beaded moccasins. We're going to marry the invisible being. So their father gave them these things. Dressed in their finest, the girls, two girls marched through the village. See how they are all pumped up? How beautiful clothes they have on? All the people pointed and stared. Look at those beautiful girls, they said. Surely they, say, they shall marry the invisible being. And if those two girls were proud and hard-hearted hard before, they were even prouder now. They walked haughtily through the village. At last they came to the wigwam of the invisible being. And there was his sister waiting. Why have you come, she asked. We want to marry the invisible being, they answered. That's why we're here. If you want to marry my brother, she replied, you have to, see, do you have, to have seen him. Tell me, have you seen the invisible being? Of course we've seen him, they insisted. Can't you see how pretty we are? Can't you see the beautiful clothes we wear? Oh yes, anyone can tell that we've truly seen the invisible being. All right, the sister said quietly. If you don't think you've seen him, then tell me. What's his bow made of? And suddenly her voice was swift as lightning and strong as thunder. His bow, they stammered in surprise. His huh, bow? We know, we know. But turning desperately to one another, they whispered, what shall we say? Let's say it's the oak tree, 
So they said, it's the great oak tree. No, said the sister of the invisible being. Oh, no. She saw at once how they lied. Tell me, she continued, if you think you've seen my brother, the invisible being, then what's the runner of his sled made of? Uh, we know, we know, cried the two sisters. But whispering feverishly again, they wondered, what shall we say? What shall we say? Let's say it's the green willow branch. No, said the sister when she heard. No, you have not seen my brother. Now go home. Just test us fairly, they explained. We've seen him. Just don't ask us all those silly questions. All right, said the sister of the invisible being. Come with me. Then she took them back to the great wigwam and sat them in the seats furthest from the entrance, the guest seat. Soon they heard, heard footsteps coming along the path. Then something stepped inside. Though they heard breathing, the two sisters still couldn't see a thing. Suddenly, a great bow and a beaded quiver from the arrows appeared in the air and were set down. But those two girls sat there, their eyes wide. All through the night, they never saw a thing move. And in the morning, they had to go home ashamed. The next day, the rough-faced girls went to her father and said, Father, may I please have some beads? May I please have a new buckskin dress and some pretty moccasins? I'm going to marry the invisible being. For wherever I look, I see his face. But her father sighed. Daughter, he said, I'm sorry. I have no beads left for you, only some little broken shells. I have no buckskin dress, and as for moccasins, all I have left are my own old, worn, cracked, and stretched out pair from last year, and they're much too big. But she said, whatever you can spare, I can use. So he gave her these things. Then she found dried reeds, and taking the little broken shell, she strung a necklace. She stripped bark from the dead trees and made a cap, a dress, and leggings. Then with a sharp piece of bone, she carved in the bark pictures of the sun, moon, stars, plants, trees, and animals. She went down to the lake shore and soaked the mo moccasins in the water until they grew soft. Then she molded them to her feet, but they were still too big, and they... Flap, flap, flapped, like duck's feet as she walked. But all the people came out of their wigwams. They pointed and stared. Look at that ugly girl. They laughed. Look at her strange clothes. Hey, 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 go home, you ugly girl. You'll never marry the invisible being. But the rough-faced girl had faith in herself, and she had courage. She didn't turn back. She just kept walking right through the village. As she walked on, she saw the great beauty of the earth and sky spreading before her. And truly, she alone of all in that village saw these things and the sweet yet awesome face of the invisible being. At last she came to the lake shore, just as the sun was sinking beyond, behind the hills and the many stars came glittering out like a fiery veil in the darkness sky overhead. And there, standing by the water's edge, was the sister of the invisible being waiting. Now the sister of the invisible being was a wise woman. When she looked at you, she didn't just see your face or your hair or clothes. No, she looked at you. She would look at you right in the eyes, and she could see all the way down to your heart. And she could tell if you had a good, kind heart or a cold heart and cruel one. And when she looked at the rough-faced girl, she saw at once that though her skin was scarred, her hair burnt, her clothes strange, she had a beautiful, kind heart. And so she welcomed her dearly, saying, Ah, my sister, why have you come? And the rough-faced girl replied, I have come to marry the invisible being. Ah, the sister said very gently now, If you want to marry him, you have to have seen him. 
Tell me, have you seen my brother, the invisible being? The rough-faced girl said yes. All right, then, said the sister. If you have seen him, tell me, what's his bow made of? And the rough-faced girl said, his bow? Why, it is the great curve of the rainbow. See the rainbow there? So it's the great curve of the rainbow. Ah, oh, she claimed the sister in excitement. Tell me, she asked, if you have seen my brother, the invisible being, what's the runner of his sled made of? And the rough-faced girl looking up into the night sky said, the runner of his sled. Why, well, it's the spirit road, the milky way of the stars that spread across the skies. And you see right there? It's like he's leading his chariot or whatever. See all the beautiful stars? Ah, cried the sister in wonder and delight. You have seen him. Come with me. And taking the rough-faced girl by the hand, she led her back to the great wigwam and sat her in the seat next to the entrance, the wife's seat. Then they heard footsteps coming along the path. Closer and closer, the entrance flap of the wigwam lifted up and stepped the invisible being. And when he saw her sitting there, he said, at last we have been found out. Then smiling kindly, he added, and oh, my sister, but she is beautiful. And his sister said, yes. The sister of the invisible being then gave the rough-faced girl the finest of buckskin robes and a necklace of perfect shells. Now bathe in the lake, she said, and dress in these. So the rough-faced girl bathed in the waters of the lake. Suddenly, all the scars vanished from her body. Her skin grew smooth again, and her beautiful black hair grew in long and glossy as a raven's wing. Now anyone could see that she was indeed beautiful, but the invisible being and his sister had seen that from the start. Then at last the rough-faced girl and the invisible being were married. They lived together in great gladness and were never parted. Thanks, Miss McNeil. Now, for those of us who have grown up in West Virginia, we're used to seeing dozens of types of flowers throughout our beautiful state. But did you know that each flower is made up of many parts? Well, for more on this topic, let's go visit Miss Sinisi. Today's video is on the parts of a flower. I've drawn a flower over here for you, and I'm going to go over the parts of the flower in both structure and function. Structure in the beginning of the video, function in the end, and I've tied some other things in the middle. Um, the, for the structures of the flower, the first one we're going to look at is the peduncle, and that's the stalk of the flower. So if you look at this part here, ped in Latin means foot. So this is the part that's kind of the foot or the stalk of the flower. If you would pick a flower, usually you pick it from the stalk. The receptacle is the part of the flower stalk where the parts of the flower are attached. So right in here would be where all of those parts of that flower were going to be, right? If you're going to pull the petals off, you would pull it off from there and then separate the petals. Sepals are the outer parts of the flower. They often look green and leaf-like that kind of enclose the bud. You've picked a flower that's not all the way out, right? And it's enclosed like this before it blooms. The part that's on the outside is called the sepal. The petals, usually that's the part everyone is familiar with, and those are the parts of the flower that are conspicuously colored. So in every flower, the petals are different colors or different shapes. Um, the stamen is the pollen producing part of the flower. So if we look here, we can see here's our um, stigma and our, and our style and our ovary, and then we have the filament that comes up here, right? And the anther and the filament together is the stamen. So that's where the pollen is produced, clear out here on the end. And we're going to look, I have some pictures that go along with this video, and we'll, we'll look at those to see what they look like. The anther is the part of the stamen where that pollen is produced. So here's the stamen. This is the filament that holds up the anther, and then all of that pollen is on the little, the, uh, the ends of that um, area. The pistil is the ovule producing part of the flower, right? The ovules that, where the eggs are or the ova are. 
Um, the stigma is the part of the pistil where the pollen germinates. So down in this area, right, where the pollen germinates. Um, the ovary is the enlarged basal portion of the pistil where the pollen also germinates. Um, I just wanted to put it highlighted here in case you didn't know, the mature ovary is a fruit. So when you pick an apple, you eat a watermelon, that's an ovary. That's the ovary of the plant. It's matured into a fruit. And the mature ovule is a seed. So you bite into the apple and you can see where the seeds are. Those are the eggs, but they've matured. Or you slice open the watermelon. If you get a seedless watermelon, it's never that way. It's been genetically modified because we couldn't have a fruit without a seed unless we did something to it. So let's look at the purpose of a flower. The sole purpose of flowers are for sexual reproduction. When we look at biology and anything that we talk about, we always have to focus on reproduction and food. So the purpose of this flower is just reproduction, right? It ensures the survival of the species. So if we want our species to survive, we have to do something, right? We talked a little bit about adaptations before, but I want to look again at adaptations because that's um, along the evolutionary perspective when we look at any organism, we need to know adaptations. So if we have this flower and it has to rely on pollinators like birds to come in or butterflies or bees, anything like that that's a pollinator, it's evolved those brightly colored petals to make it more appealing and more attractive. So if, if they were all black and white, you would, wouldn't be any reason for that bee or that butterfly or that bird to be attracted to that flower, right? So it's attracted to the flower because of the color. It's also attracted to the flower because of the smell. We all love flowers. We smell them. They smell wonderful, right? And so that's also why the pollinators are attracted. We have to draw them to the flower in order for the pollen to be carried away. Those are flowers that rely on pollinators. There are also flowers that don't rely on pollinators at all, right? They're pollinated by the wind. They don't have to be showy in order to survive. Do you ever go out and pick up the dandelions and blow those little the seeds go everywhere. Those rely on the wind. They're not beautiful like a rose, right, or a carnation or a daisy. They just rely on the wind to carry those little um, seeds away. And so it says, why do you think that some flowers have thorns, right? If we're looking at adaptations, what would be the advantage of having a thorn? Thorns are for protection, right? If you have predators or you have someone who wants to come in and take the flowers or eat the flowers, the thorns prevent that from occurring because we have to save those flowers for the pollinators because remember, an adaptation is anything that perpetuates the species. So those would have to be things that are advantageous. Adaptations are always advantageous. We don't have any disadvantageous adaptations or it wouldn't occur. And then we're gonna look at complete versus incomplete flowers. There are four main parts. We looked at a bunch of different parts, but the four main parts are the petals, the sepals, the stamen, and the pistil. And sometimes I refer back and forth because when I learned it, they called it a carpal, and then I see pistil, but it's the same thing. So if you see those, those are the same thing. So if a flower has all four of those parts, then it's gonna be called complete. It has petals, sepals, stamen, and, and the pistil, right? So a rose or a tulip, those are complete flowers. If it doesn't have any, if it, if it doesn't have all four, maybe it might have petals and stamen, right? Then it's incomplete. We have flowers that like for corn and for squash, things like that you see that you would, might grow in your garden. Those flowers are incomplete. We also have perfect versus imperfect. The reproductive parts of the flower that are necessary for seed production, right, are the stamen, which is the male organ of the flower, and the carpal or the pistil, which is the female organ of the flower. If a flower has both, the stamen and the carpal, it's perfect, right? It's like a lily or the apple or the orange. Those are perfect flowers. If it has only one of those, it's imperfect, like a cucumber, a walnut, a chestnut. Those are imperfect flowers. The other category we're gonna look at is monoecious, that's how you say that, and dioecious. Mono means one, right? Di means two. So we have two categories of imperfect flowers. We have the monoecious flowers. Those are imperfect, they have both male and female on the same plant, right? So if we have the stamen and the carpels on the same plant, then that is a monoecious plant. Right? Some of them have a carpal and no stamen. Others have a stamen and no carpal. So they have to self-pollinate. Right? They bear fruit and produce seeds on their own. So we have self-pollinating flowers. We also have flowers that um, are dioecious. 
They have, those are imperfect male and female flowers on separate plants. Therefore, we have to plant those plants close together so that we get the cross-pollination. They can't self-pollinate. They have to cross-pollinate. And so that's the difference between those. We can self-pollinate on one and we have to cross-pollinate on the other. So if you would have one of these and then the other one far away, you're not going to get any more of them because you can't fertilize the ov ovules, right? Germinate. Um, what is pollination? Pollination is the act of transferring those pollen grains from the male anther which is this part clear up on the end, right where the pollen's produced, to um, the flower of the female stigma or style. And there's a little sticky part on the top here, right? So the pollen gets on this little sticky part and goes down this pollen tube, down the style, to the ovary, ovary where the ovules are so that we can get another plant. Um, why do we have pollination? What's the function? Um, they function by eating or collecting pollen for protein and other nutrients, um, characteristics, or sipping nectar from the flower when the pollen grains attach to themselves and the pollinator's body. Right? So they either eat them and pick them up and take them elsewhere, or you've seen bugs on a, on a flower and they come off and you can see the yellow pollen grains on them, like the fur on a bee, like those little hairs, and then they can carry that someplace else um, while they're trying to get the sweet part. The nectar is the sweet part, right, from the flower. Um, now we're going to go to the functions. I told you at the beginning we looked at structure, then we'll look at functions. The function of the sepals, and that's the first part of the flower to grow, that's for protection. It protects the, it protects the emerging flower and keeps it from drying out. The petals, we're going to draw in those pollinators, right, and they collectively all together form what's called the corolla. You know, that's just a bunch of flower petals together, and they vary from plant to plant. Stamen are the male reproductive parts. The filament holds the anther, and the anther produces Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons, and we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.